Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bible study. I'm R.K. Brown, and I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to be, well, I don't see you. I'm glad to be with you. What the heck? Always something. Anyway, I am in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm always a little nervous because, you know, technically it's a little bit of a challenge doing this with a laptop, you know, me being visually impaired and all that kind of stuff. But I'm sitting kind of a little far back from the screen from where I would like to be. It's like a 13 point five screen or something like that. It's a little Mac book air thing. Anyway, um, I am, and, and it occurred to me as I was kind of feeling nervous about it, it occurred to me that I'm sitting in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm sitting right in the middle of Sin City about to do a Bible lesson to you. So praise the Lord. Amen. So the name of the lesson is Be Bitter or Be Better. Now, I was hanging out with my cousin yesterday. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and he and his brother-in-law came here because his brother-in-law had to do some business. He sells medical supplies, and he had to make a delivery on the weekend so a doctor could have whatever he needed by Monday, right? So they came by, picked me up, and we went and had a meal, and we were just talking about the good things that the Lord has done for us. And, and uh, somehow or another, the chastisement of the Lord came into the conversation, I feel like. And, and my cousin said, well, you can, you can be bitter or you can be better. And so that was the name of the lesson. And I thought about the chastising of the Lord. So I'm going to start out with three sets of Scripture that I use fairly often because I believe once saved, always saved. I believe that the chastisement of the Lord is not preached about enough because the Lord chastens His children. He, he chastens and scourges. The scourges means like the whip. So God whips His kids. And you know, of course, the Scripture tells you, you know, that the, the man who spares the rod hates his son, Right? So if you're a parent and, and you don't whip your kids when they need it, now I'm not saying abuse your kids by any means. But if you don't apply a little uh, corporal punishment from time to time, you're not loving your children. People will try to put them in time out, have little, little bitty kids trying to think things out. And it's a worse punishment when they could just give them a couple of whacks on a padded area that God gave them to be padded, you know, for various functions, you know, sitting and whipping. <laughs> and uh, and then it's over. Let the punishment be doled out and then let it be over. And the Lord, from time to time, chastens and scourges us. So first I'm going to talk about salvation and how salvation is by faith alone, in God alone, through Jesus Christ alone. Now, obviously, we know that Jesus is God, but I'm talking about the man Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the Son of God, right? I'm talking about Him in that fashion, right? We know that Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. But we are saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ by putting our trust in that. A lot of people say they don't believe in easy believism, as they call it. I had a, had a guy say to me a couple of years ago, we were hanging out and and. He is a Calvinist, and he actually got me into Calvinism, and I was a Calvinist for 20 years. And so I, you know, we were talking, and I said, I don't believe that anymore. And he said, well, I feel sorry for you. And I said, yeah, I don't. I've been reading the Bible. I don't believe it anymore. And uh, he said, well, I'll tell you, I don't believe in easy believism. But he actually does. And the reason I say that is because he told me that he had a conversation with his son, who is now a way up grown man, nearly 40 years old, but his son was a teenager at the time. We've known each other for a long time. And uh, he, um, he said uh, that his son, that he asked his son, he said, you know, what are you going to tell Jesus when you're standing before him if he says, you know, people always pose this question, which is not going to be posed in heaven. It's not going to be asked in heaven. But he said, what are you going to say to Jesus when he asks you, why should I let you into heaven? And the young man rightly said, because Jesus died for my sins. That is easy believism. 
that Jesus died for my sins. You don't bring anything to the party to save yourself. You bring the sin for Jesus to forgive, and you bring the faith. And I believe that the faith is yours. I believe that when you believe, when you hear the gospel message, and I believe that every living soul can hear the gospel message because when the Holy Spirit brings the gospel message, He brings life with it. People always say, they quote that scripture in Ephesians chapter 2 where they say, where they say You who were dead in your trespasses and sins hath He quickened. Yes. But He made you alive enough to be able to receive the gospel because the, the scripture says, I believe in Hebrews 2 verse 9, I could be wrong about that. Jesus tasted death for every man. Every man. Now the Calvinists will say, well, every don't mean all, and all don't mean every, but it's about context. Sometimes when you see all, it doesn't mean all. Sometimes when you see every, it doesn't mean every. But in this particular case, there's no context outside of the fact that Jesus died. Jesus tasted death for every man. There's no context that would change that. It's all about context. Calvinist, whoever you may be that might be hearing this, live or somewhere later down the road, 10 years down the road or whatever, it's all about the context. Christ died for every man, and after that you believed, you received that Holy Spirit of promise. After you believed, after you believed with your faith, yes, the Holy Spirit brings life. God said, I believe in... Uh, Isaiah, is it 55, 8, I think maybe, that his word will not return to him void. It will do what he sends it to do. He sends it to bring the gospel. Now, people have their own free will, and they can choose to believe the gospel or not believe the gospel. But the Holy Spirit brings life so that you can make that choice. The Word of God does what He sends it to do, and that is to give people a choice as to whether to believe the gospel or not. And I believe it. Amen. So I'm going to give you some scripture just to, before I start talking about chastisement. I'm going to start talking about salvation. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, and y'all know I've read this scripture a lot, to stay with me. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. You stand in the gospel. It's a message. And you believe it. And you're saved. If you're a person who believes the gospel and you're saved, you're saved through faith in the gospel. And now he's going to tell you what that is. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, I believe when he talks about believing in vain, people's faith is empty. Like people see Jesus as, you know, some Santa Claus in the sky, and they're believing on him only for this life. As it says in that same chapter in verse 19, that if we believe only in Jesus for this life, we are of all men most miserable because we believe in vain. So you need to believe in Jesus for the saving of your soul. The Calvinists will believe that, uh, many of them, not all of them, but many of them will believe that you can't know you're saved. And that's just not true. The Apostle Paul just told them that the gospel of Christ wherein ye stand, if you keep in memory, what I've said to you, unless you've believed in vain. In other words, what he's saying is if you keep in memory, if you understand rightly the words that I've preached to you and not believe in vain, you will be saved. You are saved. You are already in heaven by faith. I'm going somewhere with this. Y'all hang in with me because I'm going to be talking about chastisement. But first, I want to lay down a good foundation of salvation. For I delivered unto you, first of all, what I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Did you hear that? Christ died for our sins. You don't have to die for your own sins. You only need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. And you can be saved. If you don't do that, then you will pay the price for your own sins. 
But Jesus has paid it for you, but you must attach yourself to Jesus Christ, and you do that by faith. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He rose again the third day. The gospel is not complete if you just go and tell somebody Jesus died for your sins because he was buried graveyard dead for three days and three nights. His soul was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, in hell, I refer you to Acts chapter 2. And his body was in the grave, and it wasn't even underground. It wasn't even buried underground. He was, he was buried in a cave, as it were. But he was buried in a cave. He was in a cave. But his soul was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures tell us the Bible on which you can stake your eternal soul is telling you the truth, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, <coughs> and that he rose the third day according to the Scriptures. He was graveyard dead, boneyard dead. And yet, he rose from the dead the third day, guaranteeing that he will also raise you from the dead at the resurrection. Not the third day after you die necessarily, unless you die three days before the end of all things, you know, unless you're <laughs> almost one of the people who are alive and remain under the coming of Christ by lack of three days. <sighs> I digress. So now we go to Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you believe that God raised him from the dead. If you confess with your mouth, obviously call on the name of the Lord. Because out of the abundance of the, out of the, abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus said. So if it's really in your heart, if you really believe on Jesus Christ, you're going to call on the name of the Lord, right? Verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now that goes back to that thing that I was talking about for a long time there for a few weeks, and I kind of wanted to go away from it, the Jew thing. You know, because of the war that's going on over there in the Middle East, there is no difference. There is no difference. How did he say it? For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'll give you one more bit of scripture just to lay that down, just to lay that foundation down heavy before I start talking about chastisement. And that is that Paul and his partner Silas were preaching, I believe they were in Ephesus. No, Philippi, I'm sorry, Philippi. And... Um, they were preaching the gospel, and they got in trouble, and they got thrown into prison, and they were, they were in the stocks, and they were singing a hymn, and then at midnight, this happens. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So he would probably rather face his own destruction, you know, destroying himself, falling on his own sword, than to have to face the punishment that the Romans might put him through, like something like crucifixion, who knows. But he figured it was probably better to kill himself than to experience the cruelty of the Romans. So, verse 28 we see, But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in 
and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. He didn't say you have to do a bunch of works. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4 that to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, just like Abraham's was. Just like everybody in the Bible that believed God, their faith was counted for righteousness. Whether they heard the, the full gospel or just prophecy in the Old Testament, they were saved in the Old Testament looking forward to the cross. We're saved by looking back to the cross. It's all about the cross of Jesus Christ. So having said that, God does chastise His children. Now in, in Hebrews chapter 11, at the end of the chapter, you know, actually the, the Hebrews chapter 11 is called the, the Bible Hall of Faith. And the reason it's called that is because that it just gives a long list of people of old that we all know who they are. Any Bible reader knows who these people are. But it's this long list of people that did amazing things by faith. And then at the end of it, it talks about how people were suffered. They, they went naked. They, they were destitute. They were hungry. They dwelt in caves of the earth. They were beaten. They were sawn asunder. And, and what that allegedly means from what I understand that they were sawn asunder that they were like hanged upside down by their feet and sawed through their body until they were sawn in half that's supposedly what sawn asunder means it is said that Isaiah was killed that way the Bible gives no record of it so I don't know that that's true but that's what it said and uh, but we do know that the Jews did kill the prophets because Jesus talked about it in Matthew 23 and in other places, but Matthew 23 especially, that they killed the prophets. So, um, you know, the Old Testament doesn't really give much account on that, but apparently they really wreaked havoc on the prophets. So these people went through great distress that they might have a better resurrection. You might call it a type of... Uh, Chastisement. I suppose you could think of it like that. But the Bible is setting us up for a discussion about chastisement. So it talks about these people first when it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So we are running a race. The, the Apostle Paul came to the end of it, and he said, I've, I've run the race. I've finished my course. You know? So we have a race that is set before us. And um, the, the Apostle, well, whoever the writer is, probably the Apostle Paul is telling us to consider these people that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses and so let us set aside because these people went through so much that we can go through what they went through if we have to by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit that helps us. We can go through it by the Word of God that dwells in us. We can go through it. And so he's saying, so set aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. And you know and I know that sin does so easily beset us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your own minds. Ye have not yet resisted, now, let me stop right there. So he's saying, think about Jesus. Think about what Jesus went through. Think about what Jesus went through on our behalf. I don't know why I didn't divide this differently, but I didn't. So here we go. I divided it now. 
For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your own minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now he's referring back to those people that were sawn asunder and all that kind of stuff. And he's saying you, and he's, of course he's talking about Jesus Christ on the cross. And he's saying that you have not shed blood in your resisting of sin. So keep going. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. There are going to be times when sin does beset us and we get carried away with sin. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good of a Christian you are. There are going to come times when you are going to be overcome with a sin. It's just the way it is. I mean, think about King David, a righteous man, had the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit came upon him and never left him from that day. And yet, a man who had the Holy Spirit did the thing with Bathsheba that he did. He took a man's wife and lay with her and got her pregnant, and then he tried to make the man think that the baby was his. And and Uriah the Hittite, the man that I'm talking about, was a righteous man, and he wouldn't go in and lie with his wife while his brethren were at war. And so David sent a letter to Joab, the general of the army, to put Uriah, the man I'm talking about, in the hottest part of the battle and back away from him that he die. And that's exactly what happened. Joab did that for David. David put the man to death. And David was a man after God's own heart. And Jesus is called the son of David. And so, beware when you think you stand lest you fall. Sometimes you're going to fall into sin. And it's just the way it is. You are, I am, everybody is, everybody falls into sin. We need forgiveness, and sometimes we need chastisement. Hebrews 12, 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, ladies, when it comes to being in the kingdom of God, you are also a son. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you're all sons, ladies. You're a son of God. You know, I know that the Bible sometimes will refer to you as a daughter, but you are a son of God. It's, you know, it depends on the context. Again, I say context, right? Oh, and also it says that he chastens and scourges. The Lord does whip his children. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? I want to stop and deal with that for a second. I've kind of for a good bit of my life thought about it kind of like that if you're not a believer, you really don't get chastened by the Lord. But that's not really true. Everybody goes through tough times. And the Lord is good to everybody. You know, the Lord is good to people. The Lord causes you to have food. The Lord gives you children. The Lord sometimes does really good things for unbelievers. As Jesus said at the end of Matthew chapter 5, that God causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now that's, you know, just and righteous mean the same thing. So that's just the King James way of, of you know, kind of keeping it interesting, just using a writing style. But just and, just and righteous means the same thing. If you're just, it means you're righteous. If you're righteous, it means you're just. God causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and he causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And the rain ain't a bad thing. Some people use rain as a metaphor, like I've even heard Pastor Stephen Anderson say that, you know, sometimes God might cloud up and rain on you, which is true. I mean, sometimes he might just pour it on, you know. But Jesus, when Jesus said that, the context of that, because again, context, is that the sun and the rain 
fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, and it gives them crops, it gives them food, it gives them good things. It makes them able to, you know, by strength of eating good food, to build their houses and to sire their children or to give birth to children and raise families and go out and work and have good things. But God does chastise even unrighteous people. And I believe that that's why the Scripture says here, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. So don't faint when the Lord chastises you. Now, a, a wicked person, when bad things come upon them, they go the, in the wrong direction, right? The Bible is telling us to go in the right direction, that when God pours out the chastisement, and He will on everybody, go in the right direction. Don't let it make you bitter. Let it make you better. All right? So, again, I'll read. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. If God doesn't chastise you, or I think in the context, if you don't deal with chastisement properly, because like I said, everybody goes through hard times. But if you deal with it properly, then it's because you're a son. You're not a bastard. You're not a person without a father. Or maybe the devil is your father, depending on who you are, because there are people in the Scriptures that are called sons of Belial, who the devil is their father. And Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew, I'm sorry, John chapter 8, you are of your father, the devil, he said to those unbelieving Jews. So, you know, there you go. There, you know, so either the devil's your father or you're somewhere in between. You're somewhere in limbo where you're not God's and you're not the devil's but, and you can be saved. But if you're wicked, then you'll die not being saved. The ones who are like the sons of the devil, those are reprobates. Those are people who, are, who God had, Jesus died for their sins, but because they rejected God so long that he rejected them. So anyway, I'm not getting into the reprobate doctrine here. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. God chastens his children. So let it make you better, not bitter. All right, let's keep going. Verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? If you continue to be disobedient to God, even if you're a saved person, sometimes saved people are disobedient to God, like tremendously disobedient to God, but they do trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. God will kill you. From time to time, God does kill somebody if they do something stupid, if they commit a sin unto death, like Josiah, who was a very righteous man, in the Old Testament, po quite possibly the most righteous king of all the kings. He was a very righteous king. But his life ended because he decided to go to war with the king of Egypt, with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he had no business. He meddled in another man's affairs. You know, there's a proverb that says, uh, meddle not, you know, or he who uh, meddles in other men's affairs is like grabbing a dog by the ears, right? Like you, you don't just walk up on somebody and they're fighting and jump in the middle of their fight, you know what I'm saying? Because if they both might turn on you. I, my grandfather, uh, my mother told me a story one time of my grandfather. Uh, apparently he was walking down the street. She told me this a long, long time ago. But apparently he was walking down the street and uh, he heard a, a domestic abuse situation going on where a man was beating his wife and he went to rescue the woman and the man and the woman broke a chair over his head protecting her husband who was beating her so you don't want to go and meddle in other men's affairs and um why did i say that why did i say that oh right because josiah and that wasn't in the text but it reminded me Josiah goes to the king of Egypt and tries to make war with him. And the king of Egypt says, like, what are you doing? God told me to come up here and attack these people, right? And Josiah just would not back down. And so the king of Egypt killed him. And Josiah was a righteous, righteous man. If you do something stupid 
and don't be obedient to God. And, you know, I I suppose that Pharaoh was telling the truth when he said, God sent me up here to do this because Josiah was not being obedient to God, and therefore he got himself killed, right? That can happen to you. So, again, he says, "Shall Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, our fathers, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, But he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Bear that in mind, that he chastens us, that we might be partakers of his holiness. In other words, that we act right. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, we already have righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. I laid that down at the beginning of the lesson. If you are really saved, if you really, truly, truly, truly have your trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross and in the grave and rising from the grave, that you have the righteousness of God applied to you. Like I said earlier, to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, just like faithful Abraham's faith was counted to him for righteousness. So we have righteousness, but the chastisement brings about the peaceful fruit peaceable fruit of righteousness. In other words, the chastisement actually causes us to bear fruit of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, okay, hold on, let me go back. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Don't be bitter when God chastises you. It's for your good. It's for my good. I'm looking at my face in this screen here, and I'm telling myself it's for my good when the Lord does these things, when the Lord chastens me. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I looked at three different commentaries. I don't love commentaries, but from time to time I look at a commentator to see what they say about this thing. And I got three different um, three different definitions of what that scripture meant, that without holiness no man shall see the Lord, right? I'm just going to say that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And the holiness comes through chastisement, and nobody is without chastisement. So you might say without chastisement, nobody would see the Lord, you know, possibly. I don't know. I don't know. I certainly believe in, like, my mother's favorite Bible verse is John 5, 24. He that believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is, present tense, is, passed from death unto life. Not will be if he does right, if he's, you know, if he does, if he acts right and does all the good works and all that kind of stuff, or does all the works of righteousness and all that kind of stuff. No, the Bible says whoever believes on him has everlasting life. Jesus said whoever believes on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So I'm going to say where it says, uh, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Because every son receives the chastening of the Lord. And if you don't receive the chastening, then you're bastards and not sons. I'll just leave it there. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. He's talking about a serious thing here. 
I think he's talking about people who really, because I don't believe anybody can lose their salvation. But in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, for it's impossible for those who have who have been enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift, who have tasted of the powers of the coming age, if they should fall away, to be to renew them again to repentance, seeing as how they crucify the Lord anew and bring him to an open shame, right? That is a reprobate. That is somebody who was enlightened. They understood the gospel, but they didn't trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe they believed in vain. Maybe they believed in Jesus only for this age. And when Jesus didn't give them what they wanted, then they fell away, right? They fell away. It's kind of like Jesus said in Luke chapter 8. I've quoted this here just a few weeks ago, and I'll say it again. Jesus said, Be careful how you hear, because whosoever has shall be take whosoever has shall be given more, and whosoever hath not shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. So it'll be taken from you what you seem to have. They seem to have the grace of God, but they do not. Because nobody is losing real, genuine salvation. Hope that makes sense. Verse, okay, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meal sold his birthright. Now, I believe that word fornicator there in the context is not talking about a man chasing after women, although the Bible speaks a lot about that. You know, just bedding up with women, being a whoremonger. But um, the Bible uh, also talks about fornication as in worshiping other gods, so to speak, or turning away from God, right? Not loving God, you know, going after another. I suppose it could be self because the Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that, uh, that covetousness is idolatry. Okay, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So, he's talking about Esau because Esau became bitter. But I believe that Esau got over it. His father blessed him. In fact, we see in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning, concerning things to come. He, he blessed Esau. Man, what did I just do here? There we go. He blessed Esau concerning things to come. He didn't curse Esau. He just didn't get as good a blessing as Jacob got. So let's have a look at it. And Esau said unto his father, now you know the story about how uh, Jacob disguised himself as Esau and his father was blind and he, you know, made himself smell like Esau and put animal skins on his arm so he'd feel hairy like Esau and all that kind of stuff. And so um, his father was deceived and blessed Jacob and then Esau came in the room and, and Jacob said, who are you? Or Isaac said, who are you? And, and, uh, and Esau said, well, I'm your son Esau. And, and Jacob, or I'm sorry, Isaac began to tremble because he had already blessed another person. And he said, I've already blessed your brother and he will be blessed. So then, and Esau said unto his father, hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. But remember, he had despised his birthright. He'd sold his birthright already for a bowl of lentils, right? So this was the, uh, this was the, uh, the payoff. I don't know. I couldn't find the word I was looking for in my mind. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. That's a... Hit the wrong button again. That's a pretty good blessing. You know, you're going to live off the fatness of the earth. You're going to be prosperous, he's saying. And by thy sword shall thou live, and shall serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. 
And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said unto said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So instead of learning from that lesson and letting that lesson, the fruit of his own doing, you know, he sold his birthright, and that was the payoff that Jacob got the birthright. And Jacob was deceptive in getting the birthright. Nevertheless, it was his because Esau sold it to him. And not only that, but, you know, when Rebekah was pregnant, there was a tussle going on in her womb, and she went and inquired of the Lord about it. And, and the Lord said, There are two nations in thy womb, and the elder shall serve the younger. So, but in their actual lives, while they were alive on the earth, Jacob and Esau, um, Jacob got the blessing, but Esau became very powerful. And Jacob bowed down to him. And Esau was kind to Jacob, and Esau blessed Jacob, and he, he wasn't mean to him at all. He was kind to him, and they, they had good words between themselves, right? So it was all good between them. So when the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, that wasn't the individual. That was the nations, the, ne the Edomites, because uh, Esau was called Edom. And uh, so his descendants were called the Edomites. So that situation made him bitter, not better. So here's the, here's the thrust of my lesson right here. Here's the, here's the takeaway from my lesson. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and that is all that saves us. Putting your trust in what Jesus did for you. I don't mean just to say, yeah, yeah, my mom was a Christian, so I believe I'm saved. No, you must have your own trust in Jesus Christ. Your mama can't be saved for you. You must know the gospel. You must understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and you must admit that you're a sinner. And you must... Put your trust in Jesus that he died on the cross and paid your sin debt. God requires perfection, and you can't give it, and Jesus gave it for you on your behalf. And you need only attach yourself to him by faith, and you will be saved. And believe that he was buried, that he really truly was graveyard dead for three days and three nights, and that God, his Father, we know Jesus is God, that his Father raised him from the dead, guaranteeing he raised he was he was died for your sins and he was raised for your justification the bible says so he was raised from the dead guaranteeing that you will be raised from the dead that whole chapter 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection you should read it because if Christ be not raised the apostle paul says then you're still in your sins and those that sleep have perished you know those that sleep in Christ have perished so it is about the death, burial, and resurrection. And if you put your trust in that, then you surely shall be saved. There's no doubt about it. If you really trust in what Jesus has done for you, keep in memory what Jesus has done for you. Understand it correctly. Not just trust Jesus for this life, but trust Him for the life to come. Then you will be saved. And just call on Him. Just say, God, just pray with me right now. Actually, if you believe what I'm saying today, pray with me now. Lord God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I believe that he was buried and that he rose the third day and that because you raised him from the dead, I can be saved because I believe it. And I'm calling on you now, Lord. And your word says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you didn't believe, then that prayer does you no good. But if you prayed that prayer and you called upon the name of the Lord because you believed it, because you believe that Jesus died for your sins and all that, and that it's for you, not just that it's for sinners, but that it's for you, that you will be saved. 
And that is my lesson. God does chastise his children, but salvation is separate from that. And I don't believe that chastisement is preached nearly enough. You know, like the Church of Christ will basically tell you, and I heard a Church of Christ guy say this with my own ears. He said that if you sin after you're saved, that you're just as lost as you ever were. The only difference is that when you repent, you don't have to be rebaptized. I literally heard a guy say that word for word, and that ain't true. We are saved. I'll quote my mama's favorite Bible verse one more time, John 5, 24. If thou, or I'm sorry, whoever believes on him that sent me, Jesus says, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Not will be passed from death unto life. Is, present tense, is passed from death unto life. You are already saved if you believe, if you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. So that's my lesson. So... If you're watching by Facebook, YouTube, Gab TV, Gab Social, Rumble, BitChute, Truth Social, and X, I'm at the word with RK at X. Check me out all those places, anyone or all those places, and uh, enjoy the Bible studies. I hope you get something out of this because I can't stop doing it. I have had times in my life where I was a little down on it and down on myself about it, you know, but uh, I can't stop doing it. So I'm, I'm believing that the Lord wants me to do it. So I hope you get something out of it. Uh, Lord willing, I'll see you next week. I'll be back in Nashville, and I'm glad this all seems to have worked. Good night. God be with you.